we began this uh, series, I'm fine, or am I, several weeks ago. And you may be wondering, Jeffrey, why didn't we just have maybe one sermon with three or four points and move on with this? And the reason is that life is complex. There are highs and there are lows. And if we were honest, we would have to say that there are days that we may feel like a winner, but then there are days, some days, that we feel like a failure. And so we must learn to trust God every day. And learning takes time. It took time for the Israelites wandering in the desert, and it takes time for you and me to learn to trust God. And as we're learning more about Him through our trials, we experience a range of emotions from anger to disappointment to fear to victory. You know, you may have been fine six weeks ago when we began this series, but you might say, you know, since then, some trial has come my way. Others of you who are listening may say, you know, Jeffrey, six weeks ago when we started this series, I was going through something, and I've been going through many things since each and every week. And so uh, that's the way that life is. Again, that's life. And so sometimes the problems are internal. I feel guilty maybe about something I said to someone. I'm angry about something that happened. I feel unloved and distance from someone uh, that I care about or I'm torn about some decision that I need to make. But then sometimes the problems may be external. I feel threatened, maybe by a combative neighbor, maybe a nagging co-worker likes to make life difficult for me. Maybe uh, you'd say, Jeffrey, the kind of external things I've been dealing with is every week something seems to be breaking down in the house. Washer, dryer, heat, air. Well, in Exodus chapter 17, as we've been reading, God met the need of His people at Rephidim by providing water out in the middle of the desert. Does anyone remember where that water came from? It came out of a what? A rock. And so God takes care of the Israelites in this case, but now another big problem is about to take place at Rephidim. They're going to be attacked. So let's look at Exodus chapter 17. We're going to read verses 8 and 9, but our main focus is verse 8 to death. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we ask for your anointing. We ask for the fill of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we need you today. Lord, there are things going on in our lives and in the people that we love. And, and Lord, we need to hear from you. Lord, uh, it, it would be pointless to come and, and just to shake someone's hand and walk out of here and not have an encounter with you today. And so, Lord, whether I'm seated on a pew or whether I'm seated in my car right now, Lord, I pray that you might speak to us through your word today. And Lord, when we leave here in just a little while, might we be more determined and to trust you, Lord, and to live for you. Bless, Lord, now as your word goes out. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In the last few weeks, I've been trying to play and learn uh, the game of disc golf. How many of y'all have ever played disc golf before? I know a few of you have, and, and uh, I'll just say up front, I'm not very good at it. But uh, basically what it is is similar to golf, and you throw something like a disc, like a frisbee. You, you know, you want to get it and throw it into the basket, and it's least tries as possible. Well, uh, my release isn't all that smooth, uh, you know, and so sometimes my disc that I throw may end up in the bushes somewhere, and uh, in fact, where the bushes are, there are only a lot of briars and, and thorns there. And so you have to go in there, maneuver around, and try to find your disc, 
And then you got to pull it out from where it was that it fell in all the all the, the bushes. And so it can be a difficult game if you don't have some control of the disc. And uh, so uh, what will normally happen with me, on, on one basket I may do okay, the next basket I'm crawling around in the briars, and then the next basket may be okay, and then before you know it I'm back in those briars and thorns again. That just seems to be the way that it goes for me. But the life for the Israelites while wandering in the wilderness has been kind of like my game of disc golf. They will get into a briar patch, and then they'll come out of it, and then it's not long before they find themselves there yet again. Well, in our text this morning, once again, here the people of God are facing a trial. No sooner is one trial over than another one comes. And the Israelites were on their way to the promised land, as you and I as believers in Jesus Christ today are on the way to the promised land. And you and I will experience a number of trials along the way, and they often pile up one after another. And according to verse 8, then, in Exodus chapter 17, who came? Amalek. That is the Amalekites. The Amalekite people were the descendants of Esau, according to Genesis 36, 12. And they attacked the Israelites while they were camped at Rephidim. And at that time, the Amalekites were the most powerful race of people in that peninsula area. And so they were the first among the pagans to attack God's people. Why would the Amalekites attack God's people? No doubt they had heard that Israel had been freed from Egypt and that they would be on their march to Canaan some two or three million of them. And they would either have to march through or close by the land of the Amalekites. And so the leaders of the Amalekites had no idea what the intentions were of the Israelites as they would be passing through, whether they would pass in peace or whether they would attack. So the Amalekites launched a surprise attack against Israel, again, God's people. And so here's the first lesson for you and me this morning. There's no record that the Israelites ever had to fight any battles in Egypt. But once they were delivered from bondage, they discovered that they had enemies. Folks, as long as you belong to the world, that is that you look like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, go and do what the world does. And I want you to know this morning that the world will adore you. They will love you. But once you identify with Jesus Christ, then His enemies become your enemies. What I'm saying is this. The Israelites had some battles. Once you get saved, once you start to live for the Lord, don't be surprised if you don't have some battles as with some of your friends may no longer talk to you. Don't be surprised if some individuals do not understand or support you in your decision to be a follower of Christ. The world that love that God loves so much and died for is the same world that nailed it to that cross. And so what I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is this. When you get on the right path for God, expect some opposition, sometimes even from family. And that's what happens here with the Israelites. Their distant cousins, the Amalekites, are wanting to fly. The Amalekites should have known that God had promised the land of Canaan to Israel. Remember we had said that the Amalekites were descendants of Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. And so God had given the promise of the promised land to Jacob and his descendants. And Esau knew all about this promise and would certainly have shared this with his son and his grandson, Amalek. But what we need to know also about this attack is this. This attack was particularly cruel and savage. And God was not pleased with the Amalekites. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 25 
verses 17 and 18. I want you so picture it in your mind. The Israelites, God's people, have just gotten water from the rock that God provided in the mirror. But man, from what we read from the Bible, the Amalekites come and they attack. But what kind of attack did they do? And this is what these verses tell us. Remember, and then by the way, what they did caused God to say, blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget it. And here's what verses 17 and 18 tells us that these wicked people did to God's people. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way. When you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he that is Amalek fear not God. The Bible says that as the Israelites were camped there at Rephidim, that the Amalekites attacked the hindmost people, those who were lagging behind. That is the elderly people, the handicapped, the weak, the sick, the pregnant. The Amalekites snuck up and they attacked the rear of the line and they slaughtered them all. They were cowards, really. They attacked the weaker part of the crowd, the helpless, and this greatly displeased the Lord and caused Him to say, blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Do not forget it. Something else to notice in verse 8. The Bible says and begins in the King James, then came Amalek. That word then points back to what had just transpired. Israel had just received this great blessing of God with Him providing water when this attack came. Here's another very important lesson for us that we need to learn as God's people. When God blesses you, the enemy that we just talked about does not like it. So the enemy will then attack the one who has just been blessed. Listen to this. If he, listen carefully, if he, that is the enemy, if he cannot stop the blessing, then he will try to keep the one who is blessed from enjoying the blessing. I'm going to say that again because a lot of us have a hard time with this. We see all the negative in our lives. We see everything that's wrong in our lives. All because the evil one, the devil, gets you to do it. And so listen carefully. If the enemy cannot stop the blessing, then he will do all he can to try to get you to keep you from enjoying the blessing. He knows the blessing is there. He knows that you're so blessed as God's child. But what he'll try to do is distract you. Get your eyes off the blessing and something else to make you miserable. And we fall for it so often. Look back over your life. Suppose you're blessed and happening on the way on a mountain trip with the family. You've been looking forward to this trip for quite some time. Some little petty thing comes up in the conversation in the car. And all of a sudden you and your spouse are arguing all the way there and it runs the trip. You see, something will happen to distract you from the blessing, to get you angry, to make you afraid, to disappoint you, to make you forget how blessed you are is God's child. You know, when good things happen, the enemy's going to try to come and rule. That's why I said when you start living for the Lord, expect to be attacked. Expect that. You know, when you go before the crowd to get that one year sobriety pin, Perhaps you haven't had a drink or haven't had a pill for a year. Expect temptation to come. When you finally get married, you've been waiting for this day for so long to, to have a companion in life. Expect something to happen. When you, when you finally get your aging parents comfortable, some other thing is going to happen to disrupt the harmony. Perhaps you've been saving up money. You say, Jeffrey, I saved up some money from 
Three months worth of paychecks. But now my car transmission went out and took it all away. I think in all of our lives this morning, if we, we could write a testimony that says, God blessed me with blank, then blank happened. I think we could all write a testimony like that. God blessed me with blank, then this happened. You know, for the Israelites, they would write, We were so blessed with the water there at Rephidim, then Amalek attacked. Folks, the lesson here is do not let the enemy distract you from seeing the blessings of God in your life. So many walk around down and, and depressed thinking they have it so much more rough in life compared to everyone else. Don't let the enemy forget, cause you to forget all the good things that God has given you. All the great things that God has done for you. If He can cause water to come from a rock, to get water for two or three million people in the middle of the desert, I feel pretty sure that He's going to be able to take care of these Amalekites. They are now attacking. But you may be sitting there and you may be wondering, why is God allowing this trial now? We talk about the goodness of God. You say, Jeffrey, you say God's so good. These people were enjoying this moment of having water. Why here? Why now? Why not protect His precious people from this? This just isn't fair. Don't you and I have similar thoughts? Why did my mother have to die so young, someone may think? Or, or why didn't I get that good job while that spot was open? Or why can't I find someone to love me? What, when is this dark cloud that's been hovering over my family going to finally pass on? We all know examples. Maybe some young father would Four kids, maybe was saved at an early age, and he loved and served the Lord, and he had a consistent testimony for Christ, but suddenly discovers he has cancer. Life isn't fair, we think. <coughs> Look at the Israelites. They had no quarrel with the Amalekites. The people of God had been slaves in Egypt, not warriors to fight. Yet the Amalekites attacked. And they would continue to harass them for years to come. Life just isn't fair. You know, life isn't fair, but God is. And He'll see to it that justice is served. Maybe not as soon as we want. Maybe not in the way that we want. But God is good. And God is just. And the Israelites have just been attacked by the evil Amalekites. How would you feel if someone attacked your grandmother? How would you feel if someone attacked your uh, pregnant wife or, or your handicapped sister? Well, Moses immediately calls on Joshua to get some men together to fight back. And as we close for this morning, this morning you may be able to relate to some of what we've talked about. You may feel like life is unfair. You may have dealt with some deep and troubling things in your life. Even today, you may have some relationship issues, some health problem that's keeping you from living the way that you would like. Maybe you keep <coughs> sinking hundreds of dollars into some vehicle at the mechanic. You may feel like you've been in the briars a lot lately crawling around, getting all scraped up in life. Let me say, trust God with your situation. Do what you can by earnestly seeking Him. Pray, study the Scriptures, be patient, and let Him work out the solution. Life is a fair, but God is. Church, reflect on your blessings. We have so much. Don't let the enemy cause you to not enjoy the blessings from God that you have.
Christian, once you identify with Christ, you will be attacked. Expect that. I think we're going to see that more and more as time goes on. Satan is at war with God. But you and I were on the winning team. It may not seem like it right now. We knew this time would come. We knew that people would, would become what they've become and how this world is rapidly deteriorating. But we're on the winning team. Continue to live for Him. Life is a series of trials. Water from the rock. Then Amalek attacked. And that's the way our life is sometimes. We have a need, God blesses us, and then the enemy attacks to take your mind off of the blessing. This is why we must always stay close to God, trusting His providence, His presence, and His promise to be with us no matter what we go through in life. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for these few moments to share your word today. Lord, I was reminded that all too often I focus on the negative instead of the blessing. Lord, you'll bless me with some wonderful thing, some wonderful opportunity, some wonderful experience, and I want it. When that old enemy comes and attacks, and I dwell on the name, instead of enjoying my blessing. Lord, there may be some folks here today. Lord, we don't, we don't preach a prosperity gospel or, or live our lives thinking that life's full of roses. We realize there are briars, there are thorns. That's what causes us to grow when we get uh, scraped up in life from time to time. That's when we realize we're dependent on you, Lord, and we need you. Lord, we will be attacked and we must watch and be ready as Jesus told us. But Lord, I, whenever you look beyond the flesh and bones with your all-seeing eye, you see this congregation seated here. You see those seated in their cars. Lord, you know what we're going through. You know the real us today. Lord, if we've been caught up in a lot of negativity, if we've been too pessimistic lately, Lord, cleanse us, Heavenly Father. Help us, Lord, to live for you. Lord, there's so much negative in this world today. This world needs some positive. We heard a song on the radio earlier today. Let us learn to be the light. Lord, help us, Lord, as we walk out of here. Lord, so many are living in fear, whether from uh, this coronavirus, whether it's from uh, division in our nation and around the world, Lord, a family problem, some couldn't get together this Thanksgiving because of family problems. Lord, it's just so many things going on in our lives and people are being torn apart from those that they love. Lord, we know that love is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to love others as you call us to do. Lord, bless this time of invitation. Lord, I don't know if anyone needs to come forward or not, but if they do, I'll be glad to pray with them. Lord, those in their cars can bow their head and pray as Miss Gail plays as well. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying on that old rugged cross so that we can have eternal life. Lord, if there's one in our midst this morning who doesn't know Jesus, help them to come, Lord, and surrender their life to you. Lord, bless this time of invitation, we pray now in Jesus' name.